What's up everyone? I'm Nathan Graham Davis and I'm going to re-break in as a Hollywood screenwriter. Before we get into episode 10, I just got a quick favor to ask you. If you are getting any value out of these or learning anything at all, please subscribe and please share an episode with a friend. My goal is to cap this whole thing off with a live streamed reading of the finished polished script and I can't do that unless I've got 1,000 subscribers. So thank you so much in advance for helping to make that happen. Also, we are about to dive into a really cool but kind of long segment where I am doing a screen capture as I write a dialogue heavy scene. So if that sounds cool to you, just keep watching. And if at any point you just want to skip ahead to the interview, the timestamp for that is in the show notes below. Thanks so much. Here we go. What's up, everybody? It is week 10. I am on page 44 of my first draft, and I thought that uh, I'd start this episode by writing out some dialogue for you. So uh, the dialogue in the script has been really interesting to write. As you can see from up here, um, <laughs> it's this weird combination of modern English and middle English. And this is probably going to evolve from draft to draft. I'm just trying to like get something down um, that feels kind of like what I'm going for. And I'm sure I'm going to tighten that up and get conjugations right. And also probably try and find a really strong balance where it both feels grounded and authentic to the time, which is 1220 in Norway, um, but also you know, is really readable and, both, and understandable on film. I'm also including some old Norse words um, just once in a while to, again, give it some authenticity. So anyway, um, this scene involves two characters. They are Skara, my uh, protagonist, and Valdala, my antagonist. Skara is a young woman of about 18 years old who has approached Valdala, who is a witch that is about 60 or so. And uh, Scarra wants to be her apprentice, so Valdala has taken her as apprentice, which so far just means that she's really been working her to the bone for the last few months. She has taught her the magic words, uh, so to speak, and also uh, these really complicated patterns and runes for a single spell. And she's been making her just practice these over and over and over again. And so in the last scene, Scarra was able to show that she could actually... Um, draw out these complicated patterns and runes blindfolded, which means that they are now seared in her brain, which is critical for her to be able to cast this spell. So, Valdala is celebrating by pouring her some mead, and in this scene she's going to talk about how in order to actually cast that spell, Scarra needs to be able to get into a heightened state of mind, which can be done through uh, pleasure, can be done through pain, or it can be done through hallucinogens. And so we're going to start with uh, that they'll end up pouring her this mead, and that's the pleasure bit. And then uh, she, Scarra's going to try this spell. It's not going to work, or at least not really work well. And then uh, that is going to basically, she controls the bees in the property, as we found out earlier in this script, um, or at least it seems like she does. And a bee's going to fly in through the window and sting Scarra on the lip. And so that's going to be the pain response, and she's going to have her try the spell again. And that's not going to work. And then we're going to find out that she drugged the mead that Scarra was drinking. And Scarra is not going to even be able to cast the spell again. She's just going to pass out and vomit on herself. And that's going to lead to uh, the next scene where something else big happens. So anyway, i got to go from this kind of celebratory spot in the beginning, get a whole bunch of exposition out of the way, do it in a combination of modern and middle English, and then end... Um, with this kind of mean, drugged out bit. Uh, I'm certainly not going to get all of that done right now for you because that's probably going to take me an hour. Uh, but I thought I could just kind of start and you can see a little bit of what I'm doing here. So uh, we are inside Valdala's uh, like Nordic longhouse right now. And Valdala is going to pour the meat. So we're just going to open this with that action because when I can, I like to end and open scenes with an action. And you'll see actually as a transition, right before the last scene ended, 
um, Valdala says that they're going to have mead uh, the next time that they have uh, dinner. So here we go. So mead flows from a jug and pours into a goblet. Okay. Oh. I think it, I know this is about dialogue, but I'm being picky. So let's see. So it's maybe a stream of golden mead pours from a jug and into a goblet. Okay, cool. Um, we'll work with that for now. All right, and then Valdala sets the, the jug down on the table beside a burning candle. It is evening now. Um, I don't know that I need to explain that. I don't think that really matters that much right now. Maybe I'll go back to that later, but right now I don't think it matters that much. But the candle definitely matters. And Scara sits before the goblet. That will definitely change. I don't like the flow of that, but I do want to get to dialogue because the clock is ticking. Okay, so um, so do I start with Scara saying thank you or something like that, or do I start with blah blah? blah? I think I'm going to start with blah blah. blah. I kind of like the idea of Valdala maybe just asking Scara if he's if she's ever had mead before, um, or maybe just assuming that she hasn't uh, because she knows that Scarrow was orphaned young and grew up uh, in the care of the clergy and would not have had access to anything as fine as mead. All right, actually what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have her say something like this came from a particularly fine harvest though I expect you've never had it before anyway. Um, so something along that line, that line, right? So um, kind of is a little bit cutting, but also um, a little subtle. I actually kind of maybe like it broken up by the action here or like breaking up the action with some dialogue I should say all right so a stream of golden mead pours from a jug and into a goblet Valdala this came from a fine harvest um, and for what it's worth like I'm this is probably going this may change to something like that's conjugated in a little more Middle English, but I'm just leaving it for right now. I can move the word down here. And she looks to Scara, who sits So this kind of serves as a beat between the two lines, which is I think is definitely necessary. But then I don't have to write beat in the parentheses, so I'm not wasting space. I'm just using the space that was already there from the action lines I needed anyway. Though I expect the never hadst. We'll throw in an I there. And Scare usually calls Valdala mistress. Okay, so nay mistress. And that may change too. I don't know if there's something a little bit more proper that I can include, but 
the end of the day, I just needed to get this first draft out. So um, a little bit of the research is on pause right now so that I can actually get the writing done. And, you know, I've got months to actually get this thing polished. So I've got lots of time to dig into the research and figure out exactly what they would say. Uh, she's going to... So I think Scara, uh, she really wants to try this now. She's very interested. Um, she's also proud of her accomplishment. So, so she reaches for the goblet then pauses. Mace die. All right. So I know. I know in Middle English, not was not really used. Um, it seems like they usually used ne. I don't know if that's actually appropriate in this context. And that is this type of thing is why this script is one of many reasons why the script is so challenging to write. So I've mostly been like pausing in between each line and going online and looking at various conjugations and you know um, tables that break down all sorts of things. Um, but I'm not going to do that right now because I want to keep it flowing for you. So I'll just go back and do that later. But she will pull her hand back because she's very, um, although she's an incredibly determined young woman, she's certainly timid around Valdala. Valdala has really uh, made the power plays that she's needed to. So something like thy runes, thy words in room work. So only. So I want to say something like they're only going to get her so far, but I don't think you would say that back then. So. And certainly not. Certainly not going to say are only part of the equation or anything like that. So the words in room room work are strong. Young Toad is what Valdella has come to call Scara based on something that happened out in the garden. Um, it was a kind of sadistic conversation. Um, and uh, so it's a nickname that has stuck and she continues to use it just kind of to keep putting Scara down and show her who's in charge. So. They aren't enough. So are not was narked. I don't know if I'm going to leave that. Um, you know, I need to again find this balance where of readability and also the audience being able to just really easily pick up on at least what the characters are trying to say, even if they don't understand every word. They need to certainly know what's going on. So that's kind of one of those things where if it's in that space that I'm not sure it's going to work. I'm just playing with it for now, and I'd like to leave as much authenticity as I can, so maybe it'll stay. We will see. So uh, a word for magic in Old Norse is fjolkingi. I, I, have, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right, but I think it looks cool. Uh, so I've been using it for now, uh, whenever they're talking about magic, uh, just again to add another layer of authenticity there. So uh, that may stay. We'll see. Kingi requires also. So how am I going to say something like a heightened state of mind? So it'd be like kind of like empowered, but I don't think that that would have been a word back then. Charged wouldn't have been. Maybe a higher mind? I think that works. Feel kingy requires also a higher mind. This is achieved through pleasure. And 
also through pain. And then, you know what? I can totally, when I get to the hallucinogen part and the pain part hasn't worked, then I can say, and there is also a third way. Um, I like that for a couple reasons. Um, one is that it lets me get through some of the exposition really quickly. Um, so I don't need to add just another line of exposition so I can get on to the actual beats of the story and the scene and, and the tension, uh, which is just more interesting. But the other thing that I like about dropping that um, third piece in is it kind of creates a little bit of a reversal, right? So like now we're going to expect the pain, the pleasure and the pain. And then when those both don't work and Baldella drops that there's a third way, it's going to create a little bit of an oh shit moment because of everything else that has happened in the script this far between Valdala and Scara. So actually that's pretty cool. And that's part of the fun, you know, of, even though I've outlined this pretty well, you know, it's fun to discover this type of thing along the way. So I think Valdala should pause for effect here after saying it also through pain. So again, whenever I can avoid it, and I don't always, but when I can, I try and avoid using a beat and I like to have something in there. You know what, I can just have her sit. Drink, right? That's good. Okay. And now, this thing that was supposed to just be a celebration is a little bit nerve wracking because Scara knows that it's another test and Valdala mentioned pain. But she's going to drink. So, how do we describe that through action? Something like Scara studies her for just a moment, then reaches for the goblet, brings it to her lips, and drinks. So I think she should enjoy it. I think she should smile as uh, as she drinks it, and uh, and actually you know let it warm her or whatever. And Warming her is definitely unfilmable, but I think that that's something an actor can show no problem, so I don't mind putting that in the script. Um, so she smiles as the sweet liquid warms her. Maybe like tingles her lip. So I like, so I'm going to use a few extra words here. And the reason why is because I want to stretch out this beat for just a moment. Um, so maybe tingles her, her lips. Well, I just said lips. Maybe her tongue tingles her tongue. And I don't like the alliteration of that. Um, tickles her tongue, maybe. We might do that. I don't know. Tongue. And warms her on its way down. That's tickles her tongue is not going to stay. I'm going to move on for now, though, because I'm just wasting time staring at this. So. Oh, it is very fine. And. Valdala is all business now. Does not give a fuck about how good her mead is. This is her homemade mead, by the way, because she keeps bees. All right. Cast thy spell. Scarra sets the goblet down, cut off guard. I feel like she should say something like now. I don't know if that's exactly what she would say. So 
And then if she did say that, Valdala would certainly insult her over it. I want to do this well, though, if I'm going to have her insult her. I feel like there's a potential for it to run off into cliches. And to be perfectly honest, I'm already kind of concerned about the last 15 pages or so that, um, like, when I'm having Valdala be mean to her, you know, it's just like I'm hammering that too hard. Um, and, you know, it feels less authentic and more like I'm just doing it to get those beats. So I do want to be careful about that. And again, I can go back in and obviously smooth all that out in rewriting, but I like to get it to a point where I at least feel okay about it on the first draft. Oh, I know. Unless thou would prefer, wouldst prefer pain. That sounds like Valdawa, and it doesn't feel like a cliché. All right, so the spell is simply <laughs> to be able to blow out a candle using a magical puff of air. That is the entire first spell that uh, Valdala has been teaching Sierra. And so uh, what Sierra is going to do is just look at the candle and uh, say the words that she knows, concentrate on them, and uh, hopefully in her heightened state it works, but obviously it won't. Is candle flame one word? Like I just use, like candles right up there. So if I can, I like to avoid using the same word, you know, in close succession. Um, I blame Jason Thornton for getting into my head on that one. Um, and uh, it's something that has stuck with me. But I do think it, I mean, honestly, it's not that important for screenwriting because the action lines are not going to be on, or they're not going to be on camera. Um, but I do think, you know, as far as just general wordsmithing goes and general making a read feel great goes, if you can avoid using the same word over and over again, it does help. Um, but I fail at it all the time. And I could say the fl flame before her, but I wrote that up top, didn't I? No, I didn't say before her. I said it's before the goblet, but that's different. We're going to go with that. I know it sounds so nitpicky, but... I really think it's important to be this intentional about it. She need, I need another beat here. She can't just immediately turn to it. I mean, it could be just as easy, as easy as saying that she's taking a deep breath. Breathe, yeah, closes her eyes. Shuts her eyes. I'm gonna put this in italics. These are the magic words. Uh, and let's see. She looks the candle flame flickers. And remain. This is going to be a longer scene than I thought it was. Still haven't even gotten to the bee sting yet, and I've got like almost a page and a half here. Scary. Crushed might be too strong of a word, but she's certainly not happy about it. I'll probably change that too, but I'm going to leave it for now. Let 
wrote don't because I was going to say I don't understand, but actually it's I nidast understand. Uh, and again, I don't know if that'll stay or not. We'll see. All right, I actually think that's a pretty good place to stop. Um, so I'm not perfectly happy with all these decisions, obviously, um, but that's okay. It's a first draft, and I can go back and fix stuff later. But I've got a page and a half done. I only need to write another half page today to be done for the day. And uh, yeah, so I hope you got something out of this. I hope it was interesting and maybe you learned something. Um, and if you didn't, then I hope you skipped ahead because there is a really cool interview coming up with pro writers Erica Schreiber and Hannah Rosner, who gave a ton of really cool insight on writing for women, men writing for women, um, and women in film, and things like what makes a great first act. So check it out. Hello, Hannah. Hey, how you doing, uh, Hannah? Good. How are you guys? Oh my God, good. you're like glowing. I love it. Whatever this setup is, I'm a big fan. Oh, my office. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's all done with the lighting. I'm still figuring all that stuff out. Yeah. So, well, nice to meet you both. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for carving out some time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I initially wanted to talk to you guys about what kind of makes a great first act. And I definitely would like to dig into that type of thing, early pages of a script. But when I had gotten in touch with you, Erica, I think the script that I'm writing right now was actually about two men. And now it's not, it's about two women. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, uh, and it's really grounded and it's set in 1220 Norway, which like, you think we have a misogynistic culture now? Like, I mean, being a woman back then was not an easy thing at all. Um, and it's about, um, so basically it's the sorcerer's apprentice meets the witch by way of whiplash. So this uh, young woman tracks down a witch living in a stone cottage in the time of like witch burnings and stuff. And, uh, convinces her to be an apprentice but then the witch turns out to be an awful mistress and it just all goes from there and I thought it'd be really cool to ask you to about kind of women in film and how they're portrayed in film and how um, writers portray them in film and just kind of dig into that a little bit if you don't mind not at all that's that's an awesome topic to talk about I think uh a lot of a lot of I want to do it well like and you know yeah, no, so. that's the thing is wanting to do it well is the first step I think uh and not to be overlooked yeah because <laughs> there are plenty of people who don't really care if they do it well um and I always know when a movie starts if that's if the writer I always know when a movie starts like within a few minutes of their female characters speaking if this writer actually sees women as people it is it is something I absolutely pick up on almost okay. immediately Hannah so do you feel the same way yeah it's like you, when, whenever I watch a, a movie or a show that is about a female protagonist, but was written by a man, like you can tell if they just were like, no, I got this. Or if they actually like did the work to make it authentic to a, a female experience. So yeah. can you kind of give me an example of what that looks like, maybe? Um, How do I not do that? Well, I, I don't know how to tell you how not to do it. But the way to do it would be to just, I mean, because you, you can't literally put yourself in the shoes of somebody that isn't you. That's just not possible. Right. And I struggle with this too. I, I try to write characters that um, aren't white and I am sure. white. Yeah, I mean, so I just read your pilot um, and, uh, and, and saw plenty of that. Um, but no, none of the, those characters struck me as, you know, not being authentic. Yeah, I mean, that it takes a lot of extra work to, you know, from reading uh, stories. I also wrote a script about a Syrian refugee, and I was like, uh, this is not something I have personal experience with, but I read books, and I listened to podcasts, and I actually talked to a few um, people who had actually had to uh, make the journey from Syria, and, and that allowed me to at least be as authentic as possible. It's not possible to be 100% real about an experience that you haven't personally had but you can get as close as you possibly can just by doing the research and doing the work and talking to someone and trying because that's what our job is as writers right is to try totally. to get in the perspective of someone whose life we haven't you know uh we haven't lived and to put the viewer in that point of view as well so that's kind of the yeah. job you know you have to listen you know have have women writers read what you're doing you know that's that's mm -hmm. the, you know, that's the number one thing is in and listen 
to what they have to say, even if it strikes you as sure. not right. I think if you look at the, one of the things that's kind of easiest to tell is whether a female character is sexy or sexualized, right? You watch, you watch um, Wonder Woman, right? And it is written by a dude. I have a feeling that Patty Jenkins did some, some rewriting on it, but like that's a whole mm -hmm. behind the scenes thing that we'll never know. Wonder Woman is sexy. She's not sexualized. Then you watch, say, Justice League. <laughs> Wonder Woman is sexualized, right? Like, you yeah, can, I have. That's a very clear visual way in how it's shot. But, and it's the same thing with writing. Is we, don't describe how your female characters are sexy when they don't know it. Like that is such a trope, you know. Like you actually tell me something about who she is. Tell me she's gorgeous if that's very specific to your plot. Otherwise, like I'm assuming they're gonna cast a gorgeous actress, and you don't need to tell me that. Like, what's important about her? As, as a human, you know, like right from the get go. Yeah, actually, um, I'd be super interested to talk to you about that and just, you know, how sex is depicted in film, uh, specifically with women. You know, Erica, I know that that's not something that you shied away from in the script that you sent me. Um, and, you know, in terms of when I'm writing something like that, like, I want it to be character driven. Yeah. A sex scene can absolutely be a character development scene. The scene you're talking about, you know, in the first act of my script, it's the, you know, like it's two characters who have fallen in love and created this really strong and loving and sexy relationship. And I wanted, you know, to show that. So in that, in that scene, you know, like you see how they interact with each other, you know, how they speak to each other, how they look at each other and yes, how they have sex with each other. And that shows you who they are as a couple. Right. And, uh, you know, it's also fun, you know, like you're also like, oh, that's, that's fun and sexy. And like, there's nothing, oh. nothing wrong with fun and sexy, but like, there's, uh, it can, it can show a power dynamic that's important, you know, and it can, I think um, it's very much about whether or not, if your, if your main character is the woman that this experience is, is, is through her perspective, right? And not how, it's not about how the dude sees her or wants her. It's like, how do they want each other? But also importantly, like, what does this mean for her as a character? Whether or not they have agency is the most important thing. Like, even if you don't, even if they don't have control over a situation, even if they're in pain or they're struggling or whatever, like, do I know what she wants? You know, like, do I know what she's going for? And do I see how she's doing that? Or is it just that she is doing it for a male character that is more important or worse, less important, you know? Yeah. And I can't really speak to uh, sex scenes specifically, because I can't think of one that I've seen recently that's, that struck me as inauthentic or made me roll my eyes but i'm sure there's yeah, so been, maybe it's improving but, these days but yeah but what i i what just comes to mind is i just watched borat 2 recently and yeah, i know that was heavily, it. i know that was heavily improvised but um there's a particular scene that i won't spoil but let's just say i had to immediately look at who wrote the scripts and see if there was a i knew there must be a woman on the writing staff there was like six writers but two women i think and uh let's just say like period jokes are have got to be impossible to write as a man because you're like this is so taboo I've never like whereas the they, they did this scene in the movie that is hysterically funny hopefully for men too but I as a woman found it hysterically funny I was dying laughing and I was like I just I don't know how you could write this scene as a man because you'd be like oh can, so that? can I say that you know yeah. so yeah you know, I just saw Tenet actually, and that's a that's a good example because uh, so there's there's like one and a half female characters in Tenet, right? There's <laughs> Elizabeth Debicki who is like the one, and then there's um there was there's a cool moment where uh, a female character shows up in a way that's a little unexpected, um, but she doesn't really do much, so I can't totally count her, right? But Elizabeth Debicki in Tenet, her whole thing is she she's a mom. Right, she's a beautiful, sexy, hot mom. Right, so like I just, I think I started laughing the hardest when I think um, maybe Robert Pattinson is explaining like, if this happens, everyone will die, and she goes, even my son, and I'm just like, yes, even your <laughs> son, like obviously, like why in the moment that's there to remind me she's a mom, you know, she cares about her son, like what a right, you know, what a one dimensional way to present this woman who is consistently helpless through most of the movie um does like one cool thing near the end that like it doesn't really come off the way that they hoped it would it has no like emotional weight because she's not really a real character you know so. that's a great example and i think that the rule of character development that applies to all characters applies to women like yeah. you wouldn't write 
you you would want your characters to be you know multi-dimensional not just one dimensional not just be one thing you want them to be complicated so you know approach writing female characters the same way you would any character if they're an important character in the story then they're not just one thing where it all comes back to this one traumatizing event that defines them or it all comes back to they're really good at she's really good at her job or she's a mom it's like it's got to be more than that she's a mom but she's complicated because she has a drinking problem or whatever i don't want to you know um, oh, totally um, any stereotypes but like you know. does she arc or does she help a male character arc right you know, right. Goes into, you know yeah. yeah i mean that i have i'll be able to avoid pretty easily since it really i mean there are a couple of male characters but it, their screen time is pretty limited um it's somewhat contained even though hopefully it'll feel a little bigger than that um but I mean, you know, I'm dealing with, so I've written female protagonists before and I feel like I've done it pretty well, but you know, I've, I'm dealing with stuff that I haven't dealt with before, right? So like this woman, um, and again, because of the type of culture that it was, like she experienced rape as a young woman and I'm not showing that, but that's in her background and it's gonna play into things, right? Um, never written to that before. Uh, so that's kind of uncomfortable for me. And like, in a way of like, okay, how am I going to do this in a way that, doesn't feel tropey like i'm just like trying to you know pull some i don't know some heart springs or whatever or or like get some like jaws to drop like i don't want that like i want it to actually affect the character um and you know dealing with things like so she had, had given birth at one point and um the older woman sees stretch marks on her and finds out about it that way and you know, just, just things that are deeply personal um, on a level that I haven't gotten into before. And so trying to figure out, I guess I just want to deal with that in a way that is authentic and also sensitive, but that doesn't necessarily pull any punches. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, you're, so you're it feels right like a, a, what's that? You're on the right track. Like, don't show that. We don't need to see it. And like, it sounds like it really is important to you, Mary, but like, you know, I hope you took that moment to be like, do I need my character to have been raped? Is that actually something that needs to have happened to make this story? Right, right, yeah. Oh. But that, also, like, you see that just thrown in sometimes, and it's just not necessary, you know? Yeah, we um, love to traumatize women, and by we, I mean, right. not we, but, you know, in general, <laughs> gross we. Um, but the details are what makes it right, and, you know, you were talking about the stretch marks and stuff like that, like, you know, really do your research as to PTSD and the effects of childbirth, you know, like you, you know, a lot of women, I assume in your sure. life, yeah. I'm going to guess some of them have given birth and like, right. you may even be able well, you know, I have like, two you, kids. So. Yeah, there you go. Um, but yeah, like it's, a, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of really great literature out there, both fiction and nonfiction in terms of what that experience is like to, to even specifically bear a child who is the product of rape. So there's a lot you can do on your end to really get the details right. And that's what yeah. makes it feel real, is that the, the details are there and correct and, and empathetic. Yeah, and you know, I don't know how many of them are actually going to be revealed on screen or just exist kind of in my head as I'm writing the character. I still haven't gotten there yet. Um, but, you know, again, I just want to make sure that I'm handling it in a way where I, I guess I recognize that there's the potential for me to kind of do this wrong, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then just instantly a bunch of people are like i don't want anything to do with this story so that's obviously not where i want to go but i think that it's it's weirdly developing again like i i started this as like a story about two men and it's developing into this like kind of women's empowerment movie which i just did not anticipate in any way at all um and, and i like it but again like as a man i kind of recognize like the potential for me to do that poorly if i if I'm not paying attention to that. So I thought yeah. it'd be cool to kind of be able to talk to you too about that a little bit. No, that's great. I, I love I love women empowerment movies. I think sometimes some things that you see too much of is is superficial women empowerment. Like everyone knows that a moment in Avengers Endgame when the the women do the thing at the end, you know what I'm talking about? When it's just like, oh, I'll help you. And like every woman character in every like Marvel movie is like, we're doing right, this right. Oh, totally. And all the men are just be like, you, yeah, you, you do this, you handle, it feels, it reads as so forced and unrealistic. And they yeah, also do it before cool. they ever had a like 
well, they've had like one female focused Marvel movie at that point. And I'm like, no, we don't want to see them passing the football together to each other. We want there have been to have been as many female Marvel movies as there are Marvel movies that star guys named Steve or Steven, which is like eight. So. Yeah, I was watching The Boys recently and there's a there's an amazing fight scene between the female superheroes. And I was like, this is a great fight scene because the men are just watching them because they're like, well, we don't have powers and what the hell are we, we're going to get literally laid out if we try to step into this. But also because we, because they've done such a good job of, of um, writing those female characters and have told such interesting stories for them throughout the season, throughout the two seasons, I know why they're in this fight. They're not just there because they look good in leather and they have, you know, well, it makes sense. We should have a, we should probably have a fight scene. Like it was like, no, I know why this character wants to kick this female character's ass. I know why these two women are at each other's throats. And I know why this other one has shown up for the other one reluctantly, like, because you know what all their motivations are, they they feel real and they feel, again, authentic, which is, I think is something we keep coming back to. So basically your advice is simply write women like real people. And if there are details that I haven't experienced, do the research. Pretty much. Yeah, I think so. And, and then have women readers. And that doesn't people. feel so yeah. scary. It's not yeah. so scary. So. You know, uh, I think that people get very inside their own heads about like, oh, I've got this right. You know, I can, when it doesn't, you can do all the research and have all the empathy, but that won't change the fact that you haven't experienced life as a woman. I haven't experienced life as a person of color. It's like, you need people in your sure. life to do reading to tell you what you got wrong. Cause and preferably more than one, because you can't define, you know, the female experience uh, or the black experience with like one person, you know, so. Right. Yeah, and, like, you know, and I know that you were saying like that you don't, like you haven't experienced life as, as a man or whatever, but what I do think is true at least, and it, the tide's turning a little bit. For a long time, we've seen stories mostly about men, right? Like we, so, I mean, I think just on that level, I'm, when it comes to me writing women, I'm at a little bit more of a disadvantage mm -hmm. simply because there's, there's less um, great material to pull from because the, the spotlight has not been there, you know, traditionally, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, not that it's been non-existent, but there's just, there's less of it, so. No, we grow up with um, narratives about men, you know, we right. grow and up so, with them and we are very familiar with, with them in a way that yep. men and it's the same obviously with people of color i mean that's that's a huge thing and it's nice again to see the, the tide turning but if i were writing about people of color um like i think it's super cool that you you mentioned Anna, how like you actually interviewed like syrian refugees you said right like in order to get that like that's that's awesome did you have anybody like that like actually read your work after it was done to kind of get a look at it like that or oh i wish this woman didn't speak um very her english uh, okay so that would have been challenging little... Yeah, it was challenging. So we we met, I don't even remember how we got connected, but she had recently moved with her family to Southern California. And so we were kind of, we were, uh, it, was, it was less of an interview and more of, you know, checking in and texting back and forth and asking her like, you know, just about her general experience, but not like the details of the story that I got a lot from, again, reading books and articles and listening to some podcasts, but um, I wish I'd been able to do that work of, I. it just goes to show, I don't know um, I didn't, I didn't know any, I didn't personally know any, uh, anyone who was Muslim and I didn't, I knew one girl and I was like, I'm not just going to be like, Hey, you're the one Muslim girl I know. Can you yeah. read my script? Like, that's where you have to kind of like, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's well, right. Like I'm not, I'm also not going to go around and like, I mean, so for instance, like I want to write about somebody who's experienced rape in their life. Like that's a pretty yeah. sensitive thing. Like, I'm not just going to go around trying to interview people on that, but obviously I want to make sure that I'm. I'm able to get that um, the detail right there if I'm if I'm exploring that part of her psyche, you know. So yeah, um, yeah. But, but no, I think if you're asking women to read it, you will get a lot farther. Yeah, um, no, that's definitely um, actually. So I haven't kind of put this out there publicly yet, but I've gotten a couple people to agree to give me notes on camera on the first draft, which is kind of terrifying. So I'm just uh, like, I'm just, uh, I'm going all in on the transparency thing with this because it's never really been done like that before. And so I, I'm hoping it'll create a really cool resource for people. And I think, you know, doing that, like 
I haven't seen that anywhere before, you know, somebody getting yeah. notes on a real script on camera and just putting it out there. Um, but I think that that's a really cool opportunity because not everybody has access to notes from, or at least that type of critical thinking. And, and so um, it, it could be pretty interesting. Yeah, that's, again, that's very brave, but also I think um, that's a really, that's gonna be a, a very valuable resource. Cause I think when you, it's not something you really see happen unless you work as an assistant maybe, or, or yeah. uh, you know, certain industry jobs will give you that experience. But once you're, when you're a writer and you're getting notes, there is actually, I mean, we do a podcast uh, episode about it. There are right mm -hmm. and wrong ways to take notes or to totally. get to receive yeah. notes and receive feedback. So I think that's, that's kind of smart. And then you can, I mean, if you, having the, having the bravery to then watch it after, that's where I'd be like, nope, I don't ever want to look at this again. <laughs> I can barely read people's notes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. You say, I feel like, I feel like our projects have, have that in common. Like, you know, Hannah and I and Jess, we're trying to demystify the process, yeah. right? We're, you know, like we have our episodes talking about general, like I've had so many people talk to me about the general meetings episode. I don't know about you, Hannah, but they're like, thank you. Cause like, I didn't know, yeah. I never know going into a general meeting, like what I'm supposed to do or expect. And I never know how, what to do with it afterwards, you know? And like, so I think it's just so important to allow everyone to see how this actually works, you know, like, so getting, getting notes on films, you know, like we, we have episodes where we talk about that and other and like how to break in in terms of jobs and how to write every day, the kind of stuff that, you know, like just kind of goes unspoken and, and we want to break it down for people as much as possible. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a really cool project. I'm glad that you're doing it. And, you know, I know that it's geared toward women on some level, but I, I, I find it completely accessible as a guy. And I think that many will. So I'm sure that's that what we want to do. Listeners. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're women, um, so it's the untitled female driven podcast right? and our experience excuse that way, but like uh there is no reason that that dudes can't get a lot the same pretty much the oh, same. Totally. Oh like, so you've got I think four out right now, right? Yes. So five shortly. Yeah, no, and they're all solid. So uh no, I, I got something out of each of them. So it was really cool. Yes. Um so uh craft stuff, specifically on with your early pages, do you have anything about your process that is either consistent or really intentional as you're exploring your characters and worlds in the first act? I actually really love writing act one. It's usually the thing that comes out the most straightforward when you are moving from outline to script because you haven't discovered everything that's wrong with your script yet. So it's kind of magical, you know? That all comes out in acts two and three and you're like, oh shit, what have I done to myself? Totally. But um, for me, act one is like, it's setting up everything, right? You're gonna set up the situation, you're gonna set up the, the stakes, and most importantly, you're setting up your characters, right? Like, is your job to make your audience fall in love, or at least in perspective with your protagonist or protagonist? So like, you need to be very, you know, like the way you introduce them is the thing that matters most. Like what, how do you describe them? But more importantly, what situations do they face in those first like 30 minutes or so of your movie? that is gonna make the audience be on their side. Like, I know you can see I'm a Hunger Games fan. <laughs> and um, I think that's one of the best like inciting incidents in act ones ever. Like you meet Katniss and she almost immediately sacrifices her entire future for her little sister. And like, I have a little sister and I sobbed, right? Like, it's perfect, you know? And you're like, I am with you to the end of this movie and the other, well, three movies. They lost me a little at the last one, but like, yeah. that's that's an, a really great example of just that's setting great the example. states and the character and you know like it's just if you can't hook people in act one they're certainly not going to sit through the rest of your script or movie for sure and so you're specifically trying to hook them not through you know plot points or anything but through character and and finding a way to make them likable and empathetic which i think is you know um what we're all striving for but i like that example of katniss i mean do you are, are you able to, and I know this is like an ethereal thing, but are you able to like articulate what makes a character either likable or empathetic to you and like how you accomplish that? I'm trying to think, Erica, go ahead if you have a, an answer <laughs> in your head. Um, loss is a very, is a very defining way to do it, right? I think, um, you know, we, we were talking, Nate, you read, you read my script and, you know, mm -hmm. she suffers an immeasurable loss in the first, first half of the first act. For sure. And then you see, you, so you both see what the loss is and you see how willing, how far she's willing to go to deal with it. Like that's all there. 
in the first act. Like, obviously you can't always just kill someone that your character loves in the first act, but like showing them deal with, with something big, you know, I think we all want to kind of start, we have a tendency to start subtle and be like, oh, here's this and this and this. No, like you got to show how your character reacts to a big situation. You don't have to, but it is helpful to show how they, you know, like that shows who they are as a person. And one of the things we look for in characters that we want to root for is resilience. And there's no better way to show it than to, to fuck them up <laughs> in that first act. Yeah. And you know, what was interesting is the way that you did yours. I don't know if you pronounce it Stephen or Stefan, um, but, uh, you Stephen. know, Stefan. Okay. Um, but I thought he was going to be the protagonist you know, and I fooled you. And then, yeah, you totally did. Uh, and it was, it was really cool the way that you laid all that out. So then not only <laughs> did she lose him. So like you're kind of roping people in that way, but it, it was also very hooky in the sense that I thought he was going to be the protagonist at first anyway, you know? So that was pretty, pretty cool, but yeah, it was added another layer to it. You know, that first act, I actually, the first 10 pages of that script, I rewrote so many times because I needed to have my reader slash audience fall madly in love with a character who dies shortly after, right? That was really difficult because I needed the audience to care about him the same way that that she does, right? So that was, you know, I I wrote the whole script and then I came back and people read it and they're like, yeah, but, you know, Stephen is he's dead, you know, like, why do we care? And I was like, okay, I am going to make you care about this guy. It's the That's last cool. thing I do. And that was hard, but like, it took a lot of trial and error uh, to get it, to get it where it is. So, so, no, yeah, the, so I, right first I'm glad you said that because like, so that's an important element of that, that piece working, right? It was not just building empathy for your protagonist, but also empathy for him. Like, if, if you didn't build it for both of them in those first 10 pages, it, it would not have had the same weight. So that's, which is not easy. Right? <laughs> no, so that's why it took so many tries. That's why we rewrite. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's an important thing to remember about act one is it's really fun to write at first, but just know you're going to go back and you're going to fix first, it first. once you know what act three looks like. So what about the coast, Hannah? Yeah, I was thinking about as, as Erica was, uh, was talking, I was thinking about how different it is writing for television. Um, you don't have as much space in your act one if you've got six acts. Uh, and you're also setting up, in a way, your whole pilot is act one of the story of the season. So, right. you know, so like with the coast, you know, with um, Elena, I think is kind of the main character. And you know that she's running, you know that she's trying to get across the border to, you know, from, from the coast, which is like Erica for, uh, for you, the story is about a. Um... I read the first act of it. Oh, I'm, right. Okay. right. I only had time yeah. to be part of it. I was like, I'm going to read the first act. That seems. I wrote great. Erica's script just now, and I was like, oh man, I really got to read her script today because it sounds awesome. <laughs> um, it's super cool. It is. It's like, it's very big idea, and it just it, it really goes for it and mines it. So if you haven't read it yet, you should be told. Yeah, me definitely. Uh, I'm excited to and finish you this. should read the rest of the coast. I'm not just I saying know. this. It's, it's such right. a it's such a great setup. I got it right away, and it felt it felt so relevant to read it today, Hannah. Like it's weird. Yeah, I read it yesterday, and it was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so she's you know trying to get across the border to uh, what is currently America, and in my story, the f you know future of America, and um, and you you so you know that she's you know what is uh, sort of at stake that she can't really stay in this place any longer, but you don't know what the personal stake is until the second act, I believe, or maybe act three, I think act two, you find out she's actually trying to reunite with her son who's, who's on the mainland. And so in thinking about, you know, how I was structuring sort of the, the reveals about some of these characters, because there's also three lead characters, finding out why characters are doing what they're doing it, it doesn't necessarily need to be baked into the first act of a pilot, um, but it, it needs to, you need to know what they want and then finding out why as the story progresses can sometimes make you feel even more like, oh, I'm getting, you're unraveling this onion that is this character and the closer you get into the center, um, the more you feel drawn into them and the more you're rooting for them. So, um, you know, I think her arc, she doesn't arc as much in the pilot. Uh, it's just like a, a bigger and bigger obstacles and more and more, um, uh, you know, trials and bigger trials and tribulations that she has to go through to get to her ultimate destination by the end. But then for James, who's the other main character, 
he, he actually really has a, a full arc in the story where he starts kind of neutral about the whole immigration situation. Right. And then this encounter with these, um, uh, they call them climbers, you know, these refugees from the coast that have been hiding with some sympathizers, seeing that they are completely innocent and, you know, really, he, he's clearly torn about having to, having to send them back to this very um, bleak fate. Uh, that's sort of the kickoff for his arc of the season, which is, you know, when he meets, sorry to spoil it, Erica, but when he meets um, Elena by the end of the pilot, you know, okay, these two are, their paths were, you didn't realize their paths were um, about to intersect by the end, but for the rest of the season, it's going to be, is he going to continue to, you know, is he going to help her or is he going to turn her in? And based on what happened in the pilot, it's pretty easy to guess. He's probably going to help her because also that'd be a very boring show if he just right just turns her in and over. yeah <laughs> it's so smart it was a nice and, and hooky ending of the pilot though for sure um yeah and like you you did accomplish a lot in those first 13 pages though and i don't read a lot of tv scripts so because i've always been writing features so that that tends to be what i'm focused on um and i always forget like how little space you have to do all that setup. So yeah, um, especially Erica and I can probably talk about this for for days because we both do genre. And whenever you write a genre script, you also you have world building. You're not just setting yeah. up. This is the ordinary world, and that was such a a, a that's difficult that's fun though, right? Like, it is. It's really fun. fun. It's fun, but it's also like uh, it can be a nightmare because you're like, oh, I only have so much room, and I don't want to do like a big block of text at the beginning. That's like totally. the year is 2034. I like I hate that. I'm like you did a really that. great job with it. It came across Thank really you. seamlessly. Uh, and Nate, you're gonna have the same issue because while you're not doing necessarily, well, you are doing a genre thing, like I guess, but you still you need to set up it's, the world of of it's genre ish. Like, yeah, and I do. Which is a whole thing yeah. we don't know. So that's, that's oh, I, I definitely used super like, you know, 1220 CE. Absolutely. Um, well, for that, you, you kind of have to. Like, <laughs> yeah, we're not going to pick up other um, But uh, yeah, and, the, and actually the funny thing about this one is I, I'm usually huge on white space. Like my, my uh, scripts tend to read like really stripped down. And this one is just like, it feels like it's one long note to the reader. <laughs> You'll um, find ways to. So, you won't yeah, know. I mean, there's, you there's a lot in there your, until you're done writing it. You might when you're done right. when you're done with this rough draft, you can go back and go. Oh, I didn't need to do this, or there's a totally. better way to do that. But like, you got to get it all out there in Act One. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, I think you know, Hannah, you were saying like pilots are sort of like the Act One of a series, and so like you you set up Elena's arc, you don't execute it because that's going to be what the show is is her arc. But the other thing I was thinking is like there are normally three or four really big character beats for your protagonist in a script, right? That first beat happens in act one, right? So like that's point A and you've mm -hmm. probably, you know, like you've, you've outlined this thing. So you're like, you know what points B and C and maybe D are for your character to, to change through the script into arc. So like when you're writing act one, you really need to, to, to nail point A so that everyone understands where your character is starting and coming from so that when they change, they, you know, your audience cares. They yeah. see what the change is. Yeah, and we we talk a lot in on my show about how um, act the act one out is the episode declaring itself. It's like act one out is literally saying this is what the episode's about. Uh, I just wrote an episode where the act one, the end of act one is the guy that we've been looking for in this other world is dead. Now what what the hell are we going to do now? Because we were oh, sure. our whole plan was hinging on this guy being alive and us making this negotiation, and so. Um, it's the same way with, I think in a feature, the end of act one is, okay, now we know what the character wants. We know what their dilemma is, and we know that they're going to have to go through some shit to get it. Um, so it's like, what's this movie about? And are you going to keep watching past, you know, the 25 or 30 minute mark or wherever right. that is? What's the shape of the movie? But then you're going to surprise people because the shape isn't going to be what they think it is, but they, you know, you need them to think they know kind of where this is going so that you can surprise them. Cool do you stuff. want to say the name of the show that you're on hannah just so people have that oh concept. yeah i i'm on a i'm on a cw series called legacies it's a vampire diaries spinoff about like it's sort of like uh hogwarts you know for it's like it's like harry potter meets x-men a bunch of kids that are vampires witches and werewolves go to this school and fight monsters it's so <laughs> fun so cool that's so ridiculously fun how did you get that job um, through the Warner Brothers Writers Workshop, I got, uh, I was in that workshop in 2018 and I got that my, they, they really help you set up interviews. They don't 
get you jobs by any means. They like, but they get you in the room. Um, so that was my first interview. And I was like, this is such a fun show. I was like, don't, you know, so every day. Nice it, season two now. And you've been promoted. Yeah. I mean, I'm, we're in season three and yeah, I just got promoted to story editor, uh, mid season. So. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Um, can you talk about that, uh, workshop a bit real quick? Just cause I don't know yeah. much about that world at all. I mean, it's such a great resource for, for, um, up and coming writers to try to get into. And even it is incredibly competitive. I applied a few times before I got in. I know somebody that applied nine times. That's nine years every year trying to get in and finally got in and it's awesome. So it's just, you know, um, it's a, the process of applying takes up is a lot of work, but it is the work that you need to do for your career. That's why I, you, you do the work that you should be doing anyway for your career outside of the writing. Like, yes, you have to have two really strong samples, but you also have to know sort of like who you are as a writer and why you write the kinds of things you write. And that can be like actually really hard work it's it kind of involves some soul searching because I was like I'm just a middle class white girl from the midwest like what do I know and I really had to dig deep and find like well why do I write these types of characters that have you know uh, why do I always tend to gravitate towards writing about climate change or writing about you know sort of dystopian futuristic you know world building and stuff and that was fun getting those answers but anyway you find the punk rock background plays into that a lot for you (laughs) so I don't know I, yeah. I actually uh, am heavily from that world as well. So uh, I was in bands and booked like a hundred shows. And so. Nice. Yeah. 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 It definitely plays into like, I think I, I have this, um, I, I, I totally gravitate towards just nonconformist characters and I just love the world of music. So it's just such a, you know, a passion of mine and music, even though I don't play music anymore. So I always, anytime I see a show like- about, and writing takes over everything. I know, so. I know. Well, plus I, li- I have neighbors, so I can't really be like jamming out <laughs> in the middle of the day anymore. I thought there were no more rules in our world, but I don't know, maybe yeah. some of them are starting to come back. Yeah. <laughs> People are trying to be nice to each other again. So. Yeah, exactly. Let's hope. Now we actually have a little bit of hope for that. So that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> for anybody who's just watching this now, we just found out yesterday Biden's the president. So, uh, <laughs> so if you missed that, congratulations <laughs> or I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm not sorry. Um, um, anyway. Can we go back to talking about Act One? Yeah. Because I, I have a thing to say. Yeah, uh, I want to hear your thing about Act One. <laughs> the thing about Act One. So your movie has aspects of horror, right? Would you say it's a horror movie? Yeah, or is it- I don't, I got to say, it, I usually understand my genre way earlier on than this. And I don't really know what it's going to be. It feels like it's kind of going to be in this elevated horror space. I don't, cool. if that makes any sense. Well, so. here's what someone, the, the, you know, I, I have a couple projects at Blumhouse and the guy I work with over there said this, which I had always, you kind of thing that you know, but once you hear it, you're like, oh, that's, that's totally true. Is that oftentimes with, with a horror movie, you start off with an unrelated, seemingly unrelated horror sequence, right? Like Get Out is a great example of like the beginning of Get yeah. Out. Is, yeah. it, that opening sequence encapsulates what the movie is about, right? And horror movies tend to do that really well. You, like, you know, any horror movie you watch for the most part is gonna start off with a sequence in which you see what the horror is, but like that's the theme of the movie right there in those first 10 mm-hmm. minutes. And I think that that's a really cool thing about horror that isn't necessarily true for other genres. Yeah, um, I haven't done that doesn't you know who knows what my act one is going to look like by the time i'm really done with this thing it's again it's like buys you time too what's the best thing about it you have a scary opening and then people like ooh, and then they're willing to you know like they then invest the time waiting for the next scary thing and getting to know your characters so it's 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 not the only tool in your arsenal but it is a useful one yeah yeah i mean i i would say most of my stuff is more genre than this um you know like it's more like typically genre, like a little bit more popcorn fare type stuff. Um, and this this is definitely taking a slightly different path. Um, you know, so I don't know where it's going to wind up, but I did, you know, I just talked with Ryan Jackson for this last one, which is going to post on Friday. And he sent me a couple of horror scripts of his. And it was definitely, it was the same type of thing. You could even say that like in the first two pages, the catalyst of both scripts happened, you know? And then like it kind of slowed down and kind of built back up to the first act um but uh yeah uh there's something to be said for opening that way for sure and get out is a great
great example. But yeah, I think really looking at your first, you know, like the thing about writing in, in terms of just the screenplay and not the movie, right? You, your first few pages have to be so perfect, right? Like you really, people, when they pick up a script, the people who read our scripts, you know, agents and execs, whoever they are looking for almost any reason to put it down, right? So totally. especially if they don't know you as a writer or as a person. So like those first like five pages just need to be absolutely perfect. And I think that's something that a lot of people miss. I have, whenever I'm given a script to read that has multiple typos in the first five pages, I'm just like, yeah, no, this person <laughs> no. doesn't really care. Yeah, so exactly. Or they don't understand, you, um, you know, how busy everyone is and, and all that. It shows, it shows a lack of engagement and a lack of understanding. So like, but you, if your first five pages, you know, you want to be succinct, you want to be visual, you want to be as startling as you can be in, in a good way. And like, really, really spend them wisely and rewrite them 800 times. Yeah, for sure. How many rewrites would you say you do on a script? If you, do, do you have a standard number or does it just change from project to project? Um, it depends on, so if it's just for me, I usually, I do a rough draft and then I do a first draft. I don't need to show anyone the rough draft because I, I, I do the rough drafts. I give my, I, my, give myself notes, right? I do a first draft and then I start sending it out to people. I get their notes. I do a second draft, depending on how good I feel about that second draft. That's when I send it to my manager, right? She gives me notes. I rewrite it again. It depends again. If she gives me like page one rewrite notes, then there's going to be several more. But like, if she's like, oh, I get this, but I think you need to fix these things, then I'll send it back to her. She might have like a couple nitpicky things and then we're usually good to go. That tends how to be my process. If a script needs more than that, a lot of times it ends up sitting in a drawer for six months because I can move on to something else, whether it's a paid project or another sample or whatever, sure. and come back to it. And then it'll be a whole, that restarts the process, right? If I put it in a drawer for six months, that's then the rough draft that I read, I give myself notes. And then the next draft is what gets sent to people. What about yeah. you, Anna? My, my process is uh, more, it's a lot like Erica's, but I will send the first draft to my manager and be like, this is great. I know I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I love and then it. And it goes back and I'm like, oh my God, he hated oh. it. This yeah. is terrible. There's a lot of emotions that go in that don't need to be involved. Like that's, what I'm, that's what I'm trying to get across. Like, I, it's, it's, it's so it's frustrating. It's like, yeah. I don't think I've ever like had an experience where I haven't written a first draft and felt really confident in it and then gotten notes back that found some plot hole that I absolutely should have seen and you yeah. know major character issues and I mean I should know by now like right. I, I think logically I know that that's what's going to happen with my first draft but by the time I'm ready to send it to somebody for notes I feel really great about it. <laughs> But yeah, it's such an totally. emotional process. You're so invested in these characters you've created and you understand them. You know, like everything these they everything that you need is there. Right. It's just that you send it to someone else and they're like, I don't understand why this character is this. And you're like, but I do, you know? And then they're like, yeah, but you didn't show that. And you're like, shit, right? And then you have to, but like a, a draft is either perfect or awful and there is nothing in between. Right. It doesn't yeah. matter if you've made any changes. It goes from being perfect to being awful the first second someone opens their mouth about it. For yeah. sure. That's one of the that's one of the many wonderful things about working in a writer's room is that it really trains you to just leave your ego completely out of your writing process, which is hard to do because we're writers and writing is everything. It's like the most important thing to us. And what what I I, I bleed onto the page, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, but, and I don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> so just to be <laughs> like that's that's more true. What did you say, Erica? Sorry, I didn't well, you and I don't have kids. Right? Right. <laughs> we have like a kid sometimes. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that, I don't know. I, I, I'm not emotionally prepared for that because my writing is my baby. <laughs> no, but it's like, so when you- when I don't you think go that through, goes away. So yeah. just so you know. Good to know. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't go away completely, but just from two years of working in a writer's room, what is helpful is getting used to pitching day in and day out and being shot down constantly you're just being constantly rejected and at first it's really painful it's like well I really don't know what I'm doing god I'm really terrible at this but eventually you're like no everybody is getting shut down the highest level person well not the showrunner no one's going to shoot him down or they will get fired and should never do that but um but but like everyone up to the highest level writer is also getting like well I don't know that may we're not that's not quite it yet but you build it together as a group and then you step back and you're like 
I couldn't have done this by myself. There's no way I could have written this something as strong on my own. Yeah. And so you really, it trains you to be eager for feedback and grateful for feedback, which is which we all should be naturally, but as writers and as people with fragile egos that we are, you, it takes a while to get used to going from, well, this is great. I know this is great. I just need to find somebody who thinks it's as great as I think it is to that stage where you're like, I know this isn't great yet. And I'm excited for everyone who's gonna help me get it there. And like, whether that be a producer or a director, if you're in features or other writers, if you're in TV, so. Yeah, yeah, that does I mean, sound like a super cool experience in the writer's room. It's really cool. So. I wish there was more of that for feature writers. Like, we lead such lonely lives, you know? Like, we don't Yeah, have I mean, that's why, like, I'm always happy to send my stuff out for notes, even though I know, like, how frustrating it's going to be on the other end of it. You know, it's, like, it is a lonely process, right? Um, and I'm always a little bit jealous of people who are writing partners for kind of the reasons that you just spoke about, Hannah. Like, um because they have that ability to kind of bounce stuff off of each other and here like you know when i when i'm not sure about something like my only option is to kind of like bounce it off friends but i don't want to be that annoying person who's bouncing every single idea that i have about one single script off of the same person right so um so it is kind of a lonely process so i'm always excited to send my scripts out for notes even though i know it's going to be challenging to get what's on the other side of it Sure. Yeah. yeah. And you really yeah. secretly hope that people are going to be like, oh my God. Oh, always. Perfect. Absolutely. You've right. done so. it. You're just like, I knew it. Yeah. yeah always. <laughs> you hope. always I start from it. that place of hope, no matter it how many times happens. you go through this process. So, so. Um, yeah. And actually, you know what? The other thing that you said that was spot on, Erica, was like how like you understand your characters and, and the journey that they're going through and what this whole thing is about, right? So, I just had this exact experience with the outline that I did. I sent it to a couple people for their notes. And actually, I have to say, in this experience, the responses were more positive than I expected. But both of them really tripped up around kind of the end of Act 2 going into Act 3. And they just didn't get what that character, what I was trying to achieve for that character at all. And once I explained that, which wasn't on the page, um, once I explain that, then, then the story worked for them. But it was so important that I got that feedback because I didn't have scenes to support that. I didn't have the character taking actions to support that journey. And, um, and, and I had it in my head, like I knew what it was supposed to be, just like you said, but it wasn't there. And so that's why getting that feedback and that lens on it is so important. Yeah, yeah, there's always going to be a gap between your intention as a writer and what's actually coming through to, to the audience. So that's what makes, yeah, right, uh, feedback from other writers, especially so vital is you just can't see that. That's, that's, you can't see the forest through the trees. So you need somebody who's more objective to be able to point out. So this thing that uh, maybe works in your head, it's not, I'm, I'm not seeing it. It's not quite there yet. And then you can figure out oh. how to get yeah it's hard to hear but it's so important because you want people to care as much as you do about these characters that you've been mentioning in your head um but yeah in terms of just like talking about getting feedback for stuff uh i always think it's really important to know exactly what it is about this script that you love what is the exact story that you are dying to tell like what are the elements of that so that when people say you know like oh you should do this but with zombies you can be like no what matters to me is this is a grand <laughs> non-zombie script and you can yeah. be like that's a bad example but like just knowing what's at the heart of the script that drew you to the idea so that you don't lose passion for it by taking notes to make it a different script. You know, like you have to protect the part of it that makes it worthwhile for you. Uh, and even if you get notes, like, I don't like that your characters are women. You're like, too bad. This is a story about women. Totally. And no, it I, has to be. Like, and I, I don't feel like I have a good way of articulating why. It's just like, as soon as I kind of started picturing that, like, it had to be that, and there was there was no other way around it, you know. Um, well, there's not a lot of great movies about female mentor relationships. It's a definitely you know like you get movies like Whiplash all the time, but like uh, Devil Wears Prada is sort of like that, but it's yeah, yeah. rare, right? Uh, and I I am really excited to see that relationship uh, in a in a script like that. I think that's one be really thing like that I, I am excited about. Like it's like there is a real lack of like. There's a real lack of roles for older women to really 
like sink their teeth into. So it's kind of fun to write something like that in hopes that, you know, if it ever gets made, like there'll be a really cool like opportunity um, to maybe yeah, she could be like, land like an amazing sick. actress because like <laughs> there are so many um, and so few awesome roles, you know? Yeah. So a lot of times it's just Jennifer Lawrence in, in age makeup. Right. Right. Which is like, <laughs> like it's, it's kind of cool that that they can do that but it also sucks because like there are so many great like actors out there that like deserve that opportunity and like that honestly i think people want to see yeah. so oh, yeah like, i want to see like helen mirren and meryl streep gun down a bunch of cartel guys like right why, why don't i have Absolutely. that movie? no yeah. like that was fun actually uh in, in red i enjoyed that a lot that was yeah it's helen mirren right one. like yeah, yeah. totally yeah, and so. you're like, yeah, but it doesn't, that's so rare, and she's still not the main character, you know, you're oh, still yeah. Willis. yeah, so I mean, but yes, it has to be that, and I, I don't really know why, but um, it's got to be that story, and I, I think that's a good point, too, is just knowing, like, what it needs to be, and I should, maybe I should do some digging into the why, because I, I haven't, haven't really. Yeah, it's an interesting that. question, and you know, like, when you're looking into how to make these characters feel as real and authentic as possible, like, if you are looking into this relationship of between two women, older, younger, mentor, mentee that goes awry, like seek out those stories, you know, like, mm -hmm. and because they, they do play out somewhat differently, I think, in, in certain ways yeah. that, that can be told really interestingly. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I'm not even sure where to go to seek that out. Like, I can't you can think of. Watch Devil Wears Prada. Yeah, there's that you one. You don't need a reason to do that. To be clear, you should just do it I anyway. Think, I think we actually have the DVD from way back when. So um, yeah, I can think on any anything that like that that I've seen. If I think of anything, I'll I'll send it along to you. Yeah, but I mean, and that's you make a good point though. There's like there's not a lot of that, is there? So um, that's another I find uh, trope that I see a lot in in uh, you know scripts that are written by men. Often you will just it, it's just, there's so much competition between women and of course that exists of course that's something that happens in real life but it's so rare to just see it's so rare and refreshing like I've been watching Ted Lasso and the older woman and the younger girl become instant friends they're not like at each other's throats they're not just being catty they are supporting each other and like helping each other through you know some difficult stuff and I'm like this is just nice it, it's not that there's no conflict they have conflict in their stories but they like not every woman has to be in conflict with each other in competition it's just like i've seen that so much before yeah, yeah this isn't competition but they're definitely like it's very it's like, like whiplash is a good way to put it like it's, yeah it's a lot yeah. like there's no female yeah. whiplash i can't uh, think of one i cannot think of one yeah uh, i'm halfway through queen's gambit and that has a really interesting i've heard that's great i really want to check that out well, the mother daughter so. relationship it's definitely worth checking out for that and i'm not sure where it's going but like it's both supportive and there's these tensions in it that feel yeah. really real and i'm like i don't know how this is gonna go <laughs> but i'm excited yeah, actually, I'm totally somebody invested. just told me to watch it because they knew what i was writing so um, they said, so I yeah to talk that's talk about a, a complicated deep female character like you're she's just such a well well drawn character and you can't yeah. stop watching her because you don't really know what she's going to do like she, her choices can be un, unpredictable, but they do make sense when they're made. So I think that's, you're like, you want to see what she's going to do. You want to see, but you also, uh, there, you know what, I feel like the, the great takeaway from that show is like, chess is her thing. That is the, that's like, it's not the only thing about her. She's got so many layers, but that's the thing that she always comes back to. And so if you know what your character's rock is, I would look at kind of that for when you're digging into the why of your story, like why you're telling your story yeah. is, what do you personally relate to? What's your thing? And how can you sort of substitute that in your character? What's what's their thing that they always come back to? Well, that's, yeah, that's I mean, that's really actually well kind of where this idea came from. Um, so I had been generating a, a shit ton of ideas to try and figure out what to write for this whole project, right? Both as a way to break back into Hollywood, but also, you know, something that I was going to write kind of publicly. Um, and so I initially wanted to come up with a really commercial genre idea that I felt like I could write really well. Um, and I had pitched a couple on camera to Malcolm Spellman and he like pushed back and was like, you're not passionate about those things at all. And they're just not going to work. 
um, because of that. And so I kind of went back and thought about stuff and realized like, okay, so, you know, if I go back through all my favorite movies of the last 15 years, a ton of them have this same theme of this just relentless pursuit of an obsession, no matter what the cost, right? And there's a reason for that. And I think a reason for that is because like I've been trying to, you know, except for the last few years, carve out a, a screenwriting career, right? And do that while having a family and having a full-time job and from Massachusetts. And, you know, it's required a lot of sacrifice and um, a lot of like just continually going after it. And it hasn't been an easy journey. And so I kind of just relate to that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And so Whiplash certainly was one of those, right? And, and so then I started trying to generate ideas based on that. And this whole idea of kind of a a sorcerer's apprentice whiplash type thing developed from there. And so that's that's how that came about. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a really cool concept. Yeah, and I think it's really cool that you started with theme. You just really started with like, what? how do I personally relate to this story? Because that is gonna be your true north as you're writing it. If you start to get lost in like totally. the details of the story and it's, you know, you get a bunch of notes inevitably and you're like, what, what do I do with all this? like you will always be able to come back to, why am I writing this? I think that's, that's awesome that you know. That. Yeah, it was such great advice to kind of look, look at things like from a point of passion. Um, and I feel like that was kind of like one of those, well, obviously, like, what was I thinking? But, um, you know, you, sometimes you just get so into the weeds, like, um, in whatever you're doing, you kind of, you forget like yeah. the core basic yeah. stuff. And it's just as important if you, you know, if you take a job, if you pitch on an open writing assignment or whatever, that like you really know what attracted you to that project and mm -hmm. reminding the producers as needed of the heart of your pitch, right? Cause like, that's how you would get that job is you pitch on it. You're like, my version of this movie is this, these are the themes, this is the character, you know, like, and obviously as you work with producers, you're going to slide farther and farther away from where you started. But like, I, I feel like because jobs can be so fraught with the, sometimes really stupid notes or the delays or the everything about it that makes it hard that like you have to really know what you loved about it and do your best to hang on to it so that when you're yeah, going to the eight rewrite notes call you're like okay but remember this you know where we started and a lot of times that that helps bring kind of producers in line it also helps you stay excited about something that you've been working on for like a year and a half i think that's so important and i'm so glad that you said that like because that's where i think i failed um when I was kind of doing this on a somewhat professional level and I was chasing down all these different things and had a couple of things in development. Um, and I just wasn't like passionate about any of them. I was just excited like to finally be in and like working with people. And so, yeah, um, but, the, but like, I just kind of went after the first stuff that was presented to me, you know, and, yeah. and it all just fizzled out. Um, well, don't beat yourself you know, up. It's really difficult to say no to anything that is totally. a job or money, you know, like, and I can sit here and advise people all day long to not take projects they're passionate about, like, but it's your fridge that's full or empty, you know? So like, yeah. it, that's why this career is so much harder, I think, than people think it is. Yeah, but I mean, like, you know, the encouraging, I, if it's encouraging thing, um, but like, in, ta in having these conversations with everybody and revisiting this um, throughout this process, everybody has found it a really to be a really challenging career with lots of highs and lows um and really kind of barren times and um i mean maybe that doesn't sound positive but it's encouraging to me because it doesn't make me feel crazy <laughs> so no i mean um, it's totally and, true you work incredibly hard for a career and then you face an entirely new set of problems once you break in you know and like this idea yeah. that you sign with an agent everything's going to be fine you'll never have to hustle for a job again you know like yeah. i don't know how yeah. those pictures get painted but that's part of what we do on our podcast is be like no 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 that's not how that works at all yep no. it's, it's you a, have to have a lot of exactly you, you said it exactly right it's a whole new set of problems so yeah and it's it just it honestly gets harder once you're in so um, uh, my manager has a great term for like so I'm, I'm booked on three projects right now at the same time. And I have a fourth that I've been pitching. Right. And so like, I'm, I'm just, I have this whole new set of problems of multiple projects to juggle and, you know, dealing with rewrites and, and legal stuff. And like, 
uh, she calls them champagne problems because it's not that they're not problems, but they are problems to celebrate having. And I try to I try to remember that. When yeah, that's a that's a good perspective. It's a really good perspective. Yeah. Well, I think champagne problems is a good thing to end on. I know that I've yeah. taken up a good chunk of your time. I so wish everyone thank champagne you so problems. much. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So lots of reasons for champagne right now. So oh, yeah. Sure um, cool. Well, oh. hey, thank you both so much for your time. I really appreciate oh, it. Do you want you to uh, plug your it. podcast real quick or anything else? Well, yeah. Uh, we discuss the three of us, me and Hannah and and Jess Cho, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. We discuss breaking into the industry as writers and hope hoping that we can help everyone listening learn the easy way what we learned the hard way. Um, Hannah, you wanna? <laughs> okay uh but yeah we're at untitled female on twitter we're at untitled female driven pod podcast at gmail.com we would love to hear from anyone who wants to hear us talk about anything or just to give us feedback also we would love if anyone listening could rate and review us on apple podcast that would be amazing awesome well uh thank you both so much for taking the time to do this i really appreciate it i uh, got a ton out of it so thank you and I hope you have a great day. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to bring you for having us. Huge thanks to Erica and Hannah for that. That was so awesome. Uh, they gave me a lot of confidence that I'm generally on the right track with writing these characters, but they made some great points about just making sure that they have agency through everything and also doing the necessary research to, you know, make sure that I'm dealing with sensitive and extremely personal subjects appropriately. So uh, that was really cool. Really liked what they had to say about early pages. Uh, Erica was just saying it perfectly when she said that uh, our job as writers is to make the audience fall in love with our protagonists. And I loved what Hannah said about just knowing what your character's rock is and always bringing it back to that. Some good news, uh, these pages are coming along a little bit faster now. I had said before how it was taking me about an hour to write each page and uh, that has started to pick up a little bit, which is good. Um, I think getting some of the heavy research out of the way early on made a big difference with that. Um, I'm almost at page 50, which is great because this is awesome and I'm having so much fun, but it's definitely exhausting. So it's nice to be kind of approaching that halfway point. For those of you doing this with me, your action steps for week 10 are easy. Read a script and write 20 to 25 pages. You do that for five weeks in a row and those will have been five really good weeks. Per usual, I'm giving away a copy of Malice and Mistletoe signed by myself and by Jack Purcell. If you want a chance to win that this week, drop in the comments below what you do to build empathy for your characters and let's see what you got. So uh, that's it for week 10, Smash Cut to Black. <laughs> <laughs>